Today is September 11th, 1987. This is Joe Todd at interview at John Orville English in Enid, Oklahoma. So where were you born? Guthrie, Oklahoma. And when's your birthday? August 29th, 1909. And who was your father? John Henry English. And your mother? <coughs> Emma Rosella Jocks. Emma, B-M-M-A, Emma Rosella Jocks. Jock, how do you spell? J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. French? French. Hmm. Where were your parents from? My mother was from Indiana and my father was from Kentucky. And when did they come to Oklahoma? <coughs> my father came out here about 1901 or two and looked the place over, then went back and brought his mother out here. She was uh, still living and, uh, and uh, he brought her out here on a train. My mother came here in a covered wagon with her mother and stepfather and four half-brothers. And uh, they spent the first night, she's always showed me a little valley right there east of Guthrie. They spent the first night in Guthrie in their covered wagon. Then they eventually bought a farm out on the Cimarron River and the river changed course and took all their farm. Did your mother ever talk about the trip in a wagon coming here? If she did, I don't remember it much. I don't believe she ever said much about it. Mm -hmm. And what kind of work did your father do? He was a railway mail. I mean, he was a, a rural carrier. Oh. Did you know your grandparents? I uh, knew my uh, two grandmothers. Not your grandfathers? Not my grandfathers. Were either one of your grandfathers in the Civil War? That you know of. Uh, no, they weren't. My uh, grandfather on my mother's side was, was born in France, came over here from France. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather on my father's side, he was in Kentucky, and uh, uh, Kentucky had a lot of neutral people there, and he was a farmer and taking care of his uh, family and didn't go to the, the Civil War. Mm -hmm. I know the Union soldiers came through there once, and uh, he was out in the field plowing, and uh, they demanded his team. He said, well, he, that was the only way he had to make a living for his family, that if they took his team, they'd have to take his life, too. So uh, the, one of the couple of them raised their muskets, and the uh, lead, uh, colonel told them not to, not to shoot him, let him go. What part of Kentucky was that? Oh, he was around Maribone, Kentucky. Do you have any stories about the trip from France to America? No, I don't. That uh, See, my, my grandfather died... Uh, uh, before the 1900s, he died from a ruptured appendix, and, and I never did hear know of him or hear from uh, his uh, wife anything, my grandmother, anything about his trip over here. But uh, my one of my brothers went over there several years ago and looked at this uh, name Jacques up. Of course, that's a pretty common name in France, and uh, my mother called herself Jacques. It spells like Jacques, but in France it's called Jacques. And uh, my brother found the, uh, where they'd been in a pottery business there for years in France. And he had uh, the, he met one of the jocks over there, young fellow. And, uh, they finally got together and knew how to talk a little bit. And, and he gave uh, he was a pottery. He gave us uh, him five little vases that he made, one for each one of the English boys. What part of France? It's in the Alsace Lorraine uh, place there, between France and Germany. My grandfather's name was Charles Freddy. He Charles came from your French and your Frederick from your the German side. So this is right in the mix there between the at last Alsace Lorraine country where it's both French and German. Did he ever say or ever hear why they came to America? No, I don't know why they did. Mm -hmm. Just probably like everybody else looking for a better way of life. Uh now were you born in Guthrie itself in town? Uh, we lived on a farm, Dad did about 160 acres adjoining Guthrie on the southeast corner. And we had born in a little two or three room shack there that, that, that had been built there out of big white cottonwood boards. Wasn't no, I never did remember any paint on it, I guess I didn't suppose to paint them old uh, boards like that, but uh, my older brother and I was born in that place, and then my other three brothers were born in another house about a half a mile from there on the other side of the place. Was that a homestead house that you were born No, in? it wasn't. He, he, it was part of the school land he'd bought. He bought that uh, before he, he was married. Mm -hmm. um, so your father did some farming then? Yes, he okay. did farming and, and a rural carrier too. Okay. As a small boy, what chores did you do in the farm? Well, most all chores, like 
street and, and chickens and, and the hogs and uh, gathering the eggs. And, and uh, when I got old enough, I began to milk, and, which was a bad thing because it turned into really not a very fun job milking a whole lot of cows. Mm -hmm. And just regular chores, cutting in wood and bringing in wood and killing and, and so forth. Um, you, you plow with a walking plow? Yes, I have. How many acres can you plow in one day? I, I don't know how many people uh, a person can plow or supposed to plow, but we just plow little jags at a time. I never didn't know how many acres there were or nothing, but we did plow with a walking plow. Would you tell me exactly how a walking plow works? How you hold the plow, how the harness fits over the horse and you? And well, ordinarily you can tie the lines together and put them over your shoulder at the right length and, and walk. And walk. And the horses generally, when they get to the end, they know how to turn around. They know how to turn around and get back to the next row. A horse is not a dumb animal, but you can just kind of touch the line, and they will, but they will turn, and you can tell them what you want to do, and they'll learn to, what to do. And uh, what kind of blade or mold board did you have on the walking plow? It was just a regular, uh, uh, oh, I don't know how many inches it is, about 12 or 16 inch mold board. It turned out a pretty good size bunch of sod at one time. Never did do much of that. Okay. Did a lot of herring and stuff like that. What's the difference between a regular plow and a sod plow? What's the difference? Well, a sod plow is made just to cut so deep, to, not to go in just so far. They don't want just uh, enough of that sod, so not too deep, just enough to, uh, to hold the, it together. Probably two and a half, three inches would be my guess. I don't know. I never did see one in operation, but it, to my notion, the sod plow is one that cuts shallow and never goes any deeper. And who was the postmaster here when your father was a mail carrier, you know? Oh, I think that uh, there was several. DeSelms was a postmaster there for a while. Then uh, in later years, uh, uh, a man by the name of Martin was postmaster there at Guthrie. And, uh, up, and my brother got what was in the post office there, Eugene. He was a carrier and, and uh, the assistant postmaster for a number of years and, and retired as postmaster at Guthrie in 1980. When he retired, he had been in English on the payroll in the Guthrie Post Office for 71 years. Hmm. Every year. How did your father deliver the mail? Well, first I, I heard him talk about it in a two-wheel cart, you know. Then, of course, in uh, stormy weather, snow and stuff, he'd go horseback. He'd get through snow drifts better than he could with a horse, uh, being with a buggy. Then he got in the buggy, four-wheel buggy, with in winter had side curtains around it, and had a lantern between your legs, the big wrap rope, try to keep warm. And then, of course, later when the Model Ts came out, why he drove Model Ts for a number of years and went to other makes of cars. Mm -hmm. um, how how long was his route? Well, at, uh, ordinarily a, a horse and buggy route was about 25 miles. It took him a good day to deliver that mail. But uh, then as the uh, uh, people retired and got motorized routes for automobiles, they became longer and made it just about uh, one, just half as many as they were before when they were uh, horse drawn. Did your father ever tell you any stories about moving the capital from Guthrie to Oklahoma City? Yes, I, I heard him tell it and other people too. Well, tell me what, why, where, what happened? Well, uh, Guthrie was, of course, the uh, territorial capital, and the Constitution was written there in, a, in the uh, a building which is now destroyed. The Constitution of Oklahoma was written there. Then, when Oklahoma became a state, November the 16th, 1907, why uh, it uh, was declared the capital, and uh, I don't remember being there, but the, uh, they uh, joined the two states together. I mean, the two territory, Indian territory, Oklahoma territory, together, and they had the ceremonies on the f uh, steps of the Carnegie Library right there in, in Guthrie, mm -hmm. and uh, heard a lot about that. But anyway, uh, in a few years, Oklahoma City decided they wanted to have an election and uh, rule the capital, of Oklahoma City. Well, I don't know how the election ever came out, whether they ever finished counting the votes, but the night of the election, someone jumped in the Capitol building there in Oklahoma City, claimed, I mean in Guthrie, claiming they got in the window some way and got the seal of the state of Oklahoma, took it to Oklahoma City, and Oklahoma City said, we're the Capitol, we've got the seal. So that's as far as I know is the story that they tell. 
Mm -hmm. Does Guthrie look pretty much today as it did when you were a small boy? Yes, Guthrie, uh, uh, when uh, tr uh, the first governor, Charles Haskell, said he'd make grass grow in the streets of Guthrie when he took the capital away, and he almost did, I guess he did. But anyway, Guthrie was an old town, as, as uh, all, all the same architect by a Frenchman, and uh, those old buildings, they weren't torn down like they were in other towns. They, they were main, main in, intact. Of course, the upper stories, nothing was in them hardly. And they uh, just, windows were out and everything, but they eventually, they, they just left those old buildings there. They had businesses in the bottom and they reconditioned the front of them. But now, in the later years, they've turned around and, and took off those, old, those new aluminum fronts and exposed the uh, the old fronts, and they've uh, put brick sidewalks in, and, and uh, they restored some of those buildings, the uh, Victor building there as well, that, that has the San Plum restaurant in it today. I remember that used to be an old building we went to, I uh, joined the Woodman, and up there where that San Plum restaurant is, was a big hall there, and that was a, a Woodman's Lodge up there where that San Plum restaurant is today. And then, of course, the, uh, the printing, printing, uh, uh, cap, the, Pretty place there that had the first newspaper. It's still there. It's a part of the historical society. It's a printing museum, and uh, it's it's a rather uh, interesting place to go through. All the old machinery still down in the basement and working order, and it's, it's an interesting place. And all the old buildings there. There's the old, old uh, Bluebell Saloon there, where Tom Mix used to uh, tin bar. It's still there. Still called the Bluebell Saloon, and it's right across the street, kind of from the uh, printing uh, museum. And then, of course, the uh, 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 Territorial Museum there, it joins the Guthrie, uh, old, old Carnegie Library. And uh, it's, a, it's one of the better museums in the state, I think, for historical purposes, because the history of Oklahoma is right there in Guthrie. Where did you start the school? Started school in the city schools. We were just a, uh, half, half, about a mile from the city school there on the farm, so we went to the city schools we, uh, all the time. It was a capital school because uh, this uh, building they had there, the, there wasn't exactly the state capital, but they built it for, uh, the legislature met there for the first three years while Guthrie was still the capital. It's just uh, less than a mile from where I was born, that capital building. And we went to, went to school, city schools there. We called capital school because it was pretty close, a few blocks from the what the, was supposed to be the state capital. Um, what were your teacher's name? Your first teacher's name? Do you remember? I don't remember my primary teacher's name, but uh, I do remember. I think it was about the fifth grade teacher. His name was Morris. This is Morris, and uh, I. Uh, I remember her because she used to whip the people, children, a lot, quite a bit. I know my older brother was always in trouble. Someone said he got a whipping every day for her. But I don't know. I never did it, but I think one or two whippings. I'm not, not bad. What kind of game do you play in school? Well, uh, marbles was quite a thing at that time. We play marbles. Then uh, they would have swings, and then uh, but the but main, main game I remember just getting and have, playing marbles. And when you were growing up, what kind of recreation did you do, did your family have? Well, being out in the farm like that, we weren't really connected to any of the city things. And of course, uh, in early days, there was no, no mo mode of transportation until uh, automobiles came in in the 16s, 19, 16s, or 17s. And, uh, but uh, I never did uh, go to any dances or nothing like that. We'd go to to the picture show. That was about the main point of entertainment. My dad was a, a mason, and when he'd go to the lodges at night once a week, we'd go in there and, and uh, sit through a double feature, some western or something, wait until he got out of the lodge, and we, that would happen about once a week, so that was our entertainment, plus going to uh, uh, Sunday school on Sunday, and then maybe once a year have a Sunday school picnic, and that was just about the height of my entertainment. Uh, what was the name of the theater? Well, the old Melba Theater. It's uh, now called the Pollard. It's, they have a lot of uh, stage shows in there now. That's another thing that Guthrie's come out with. They've got a, a, uh, this picture show that, uh, that uh, they're having uh, re uh, revival of the vaudevilles and different acts and like the old Lysing, you know, the numbers used to have. And 
and stuff. They're trying to get Guthrie to, as the way it was, and it's, I believe in a few years, by 1989, when they're going to have the uh, centennial here for the run, that uh, it's, it's getting on the map. Guthrie is close to Oklahoma City, but Guthrie is not dead yet. Remember any of the movie that you went to see? Oh, I don't know. We saw a lot of cowboy movies. Tom Mix, well, I like Tom Mix, and, and uh, various things like that. Hop along Cassidy and them earlier, earlier cowboy pictures. No, were they silent movies that you? Oh yes, they're silent up until okay. I think 1928 before we got talkies. Tell me about your first talking movie. What did you think of it? Well, I believe it was Al Joseph that I saw. I was going to school in Stillwater, 1928 or 29, somewhere in there. And Al Jolson with, uh, in, uh, forgot the name of this, it was, uh, The Jazz Singer. The Jazz Singer. That was the first uh, talking movie I, I, I remember. I know it was the first one I saw because I was in Stillwater going to school at uh, OSU. And, uh, well, I enjoyed it. Anybody would have, that had thought of uh, silent movies with uh, writing up there telling you what was going on, enjoyed it. Of course, it was a little rough and edited, but it, it was a good show for that time, the first talking movie. Do you remember any, did you do any work for the war effort in World War I? No, I was too young for that. So I was born in 1909, yeah. and uh, I don't, uh, about the only thing I remember about World War I at, at uh, well, about 11 o'clock on November the 11th, my brother and I was coming in from town riding an old horse, and uh, we about a block or two from home, uh, home, and all the whistles and everything went blowing in town, because we could hear them, we didn't know what was going on. And of course, didn't have any radios or t television or any other way. But when Dad got home from his route, rural route that day, he said the war was over. That they had signed the armistice and they were celebrating at 11 o'clock. And we, we didn't know what all the whistles and things were about, but we found out. But of course, we, I was just about nine, ten years old then, and uh, it didn't. Uh, uh, I was too young to do anything about that. Mm -hmm. uh, what year did you graduate from high school? 1927. 1927. What was, can you just tell me what life was like in high school in the 1920s and the Roaring Twenties? Well, uh, they called them the Roaring Twenties, but I don't know why. I don't, I guess, uh, uh, I went to high school from 20, uh, graduated, as you said, in 27. And uh, I never did go to any dances or nothing like that. I never did learn to dance. And uh, living out in the country, we'd just go to school and, and then come home, work on the farm, do the chores, get back up the next morning, go to school. It was the same thing for me over and over. But I suppose they, people in t town had entertainments and things they went to, but uh, I never was a part of that. Was, so that's... What about any of the girls in high school, were they uh, I think they're called flappers. Well, I think they was called flappers then, more so in a little later years, in 28, 29, and 30 there in college, it was called flapper, but uh, I didn't uh, know why they called them flappers. They just, uh, I suppose, just uh, uh, a word they made up for a girl in that period of time, like they might call uh, girls today, something else, you know, yep. different things, it's just a word they they got, oh, they danced at Charleston, did things like that, I guess, but, uh, and they uh, began to wear short hair, and uh, uh, they were pretty well liberated, you might say, started the liberation. Mm -hmm. Did they wear the short dresses? Well, I don't think they're too short at that time, mm -hmm. yeah. Why did you go to A&M? Well, I didn't know, I wanted to go to school, and uh, so I thought that uh, I'd go take uh, education, school teaching. And since it was close there, and my brother had went there the year before, he was a year ahead of me in school, he went there. So I went over there and enrolled in the School of Education. We went there four years and graduated in 1931. Um, did you stay on campus? Yes, I stayed in the dormitory on, on campus there. Which dormitory? Uh, Hanner Hall. Oh. Still there. Still there, but I think there's something else. It's not yeah. a dormitory now, but it's still there. Would you describe the what your how your room is decorated at A and M? Well, I don't think there's any decorations. It's just what you call a Murphy bed that you pull two two beds for two in a room, pull them down at night to sleep on, and just a desk there for two sides of studying. And if you uh, 
uh, had curtains. That's all I know, but I don't think there's any, if I remember, there's no pictures on the wall unless you put them there yourself. But it's just, it just a room, that's all. It was just a matter of a place to live and, uh, and uh, a lavatory there to, walk, to shave and take care of yourself in your room and showers around the corner. And uh, so it was... Uh, How big was the room? Oh, I suppose it was a uh, 8 by 10. I don't think there's any 12. They probably 8 by 10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. And where'd, where'd you take your meals? Oh, most generally, uh, there's a cafeteria right behind us there, and uh, I uh, would take my meals there sometimes, and then sometimes we'd have boarding houses out that you we'd go to that we'd get good uh, sit down and have a home type cooked meal and and so forth. And uh, there's the cafeteria right behind us there. They had a contest to name that one. Didn't call it the cafeteria. Won a name for it. I entered that contest and I named it the Orange, I called it the Orange Lantern. And they selected my name as the winner and stayed the Orange Lantern for years and years. It was the Orange Lantern. What did you get for winning the prize? Five dollar meal ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Which lasts a couple of weeks probably. <laughs> Could you tell me how the campus at A&M has changed from 27, 28 until now? Well, I've, I've been down there a lot, uh, quite a bit in the last few years. Went there in, in of course, in 1981 to our 50th reunion there. And, uh, of course, I've been there and there a few times before that. But uh, it's, uh, oh, three times as large and large dormitories and uh, uh, residents on, on campus there and all kinds of new buildings that just stretched out to other the administration building, Whitehurst Hall, which is now in the east end of the campus, it was the west end when I was going to school. It just grown so much out there toward out toward the agricultural buildings and 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 everything. And of course, uh, the uh, they're just now doing the uh, Gallagher Hall over. We call it the Galver Iba Hall and instead of the just Gallagher Hall. And of course, they built a new football stadium there. I think that stadium is, if I remember, oh, about the only one in the United States that runs east and west. Did you know that? Yeah. It, it, it's laid out east and west. Most uh, football uh, uh, fields are north and south. Huh. Never noticed that. Who was Lewis? No, so it's Lewis Field, Lewis Stadium there. I don't know what Lewis was, or Lewis Field. That mail came after my time, but of course I remember Gallagher. He was coach, and I was the, uh, the basketball coach, and Gallagher the wrestling coach. Tell me about Mr. Gallagher. Well, I've, uh, I've, I've, uh, I thought well, Gallagher was one of the best uh, wrestling coaches in, in, in the United States or anywhere else. He was, uh, and he had very good teams there. and. Uh, he was a quiet little little man. He actually wrestled when he was in uh, college, but he was he was a small person. But they everybody at, that worked under him seemed to like him very much, and uh, he was a, a, a good man and had good teams. Because mm -hmm. I remember there were several of them that be, uh, be, were national champions, and when some of them went on to be Olympic champions. In fact, there was one man, one boy on the team there that I wrestled when I was in high school, Bobby Pierce. He went on to, to uh, at Stillwater, same as I did, when I didn't take up wrestling. Uh, he went and took up wrestling, and he became the uh, 1932 the world's champion at the Olympics. I was wrestling for 10 minutes. He couldn't, he couldn't pin it, but he had the decision over me. <laughs> and uh, okay, how many students were at A&M when you were going there? I think there's only about six or seven thousand. It's over 21 or 2,000, maybe more now. It's larger. Last few years, it's had a larger enrollment than OU. How about recreation in college? What would you do for recreation? Well, didn't do too much because I, I had to work for a living then. You couldn't. Uh, my folks had five children, so I, we had uh, got a little help from them. But then I worked in the uh, college library there at 20 cents an hour. And uh, I would open the place and close it. Open it in the morning, close it at night. I think I was the only one that ever had a key to it. But, and, but anyway, I'd work there in my spare time. So at nights, I'd be the, they'd use me as the reference librarian because they'd go home, you know, regular librarian, reference librarian, go home, and I'd uh, go there after supper, and I'd be uh, the reference librarian for people that wanted to know something at night if, that they couldn't find for themselves, and I became uh, uh, known as a pretty good reference librarian at night. Where was the library at that time? Well, it was just uh, west of Old Central. It's been torn down now. It was just uh, right west of Old Central. First building you'd run into at west of Old Central there. 
and it was, uh, I, 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 they knocked it down and built it yeah, before I ever knew about it. And it's built a new one, of course, which is a nice library. But I'd worked, uh, I'd worked, uh, uh, go to summer school there too. Work, they wanted me to go to work, to work at the, the library there doing summer school. And we would, uh, I'd just stay there and take sh uh, sh a few courses in the summertime and enroll in school and work in the library. Have you been in Old Central since they restored it? Yes, I've been there a couple, uh, well, about three years ago. How does that, is that, is that a pretty good restoration from what you remember? Well, yes. Well, of course, they had restored it uh, some when it was in school there. They tried to. They quit having classes in it and uh, and there for a long time before they uh, re uh, remodeled it and they made it safer, I think, by shoring it up and be sure it wouldn't fall down or something. And uh, But it, it seemed to be a good, solid old building yet. And uh, it, uh, uh, I've been I've been through it, and uh, it's it, it's nice there. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the OU and A and M football games. Well, of course, that was a big game. Whenever the uh, A and M, uh, we called it A and M then, Oklahoma Ag Coast Mechanical College. We would uh, go to Norman. That lots of times they'd have uh, jalopy races down there. No. Or, uh, model T's and things, you know, that get uh, uh, um, even Model A's and Model T's and everything. They race, you know, have a race with Stillwater to, uh, to, oh, to Norman to see which one get there first. It'd be a prize. I remember some of the the uh, names of the cars. They named their cars. It was constipated, can't pass a thing. <coughs> or calculus, hard to pass. <laughs> some of the names of the cars I remember. <laughs> anyway, that uh, that was quite a rivalry between OU. And uh, uh, Oklahoma A and M. I think that first game uh, they between those two schools was played in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Yeah, it was. And uh, right there on the banks of the Cottonwood River. Mm -hmm. They're in Medicine Park. Mm -hmm. Now Mineral Wells Park. Mineral Wells Park. Park. Mineral Wells Park. Wells Park. Park. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now this jalopy race was it cars from OU and OSU both. No, just uh, we just uh, OU never did come race towards Stillwater, but I remember Stillwater always racing them cars down to 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 Norman. But uh, I don't know five, six, seven of them start, maybe one was finished. <laughs> what was the prize? I don't remember that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, who won the games those years when you were going? Well, uh, Ed uh, Waldorf was our coach there. He was a good coach. But uh, it'd be about half and half yeah. in football. Mm -hmm. But I think we were just a little bit better than they were in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know about the other sports because I'd be interested in wrestling and football. Yeah. And of course, o uh, o OSU now is one of the leaders in the number of uh, uh, national champions been won. I think uh, uh, University of Southern Cal and Oklahoma State is next by being. Well, first, of course, they've got that. They've got golf and baseball and, and everything. That, in fact, that golf, uh, uh, Laban Harris was a uh, uh, golf coach there for years and years, and he came from Guthrie. He was uh, the receiver of the Guthrie Country Club when I was working there in 1937-38, and he went over there and became their coach in golf, and, and he has really brought that school ahead. Of course, he's been retired several years now. Did you know Dr. Bennett? Yes. Tell me about him. Well, he was a distinguished-looking man. He was a, he, he was a good man. He uh, seemed to be a fair man, and uh, he uh, had uh, several sons there. That he had went to school there, and I've I've been in his office for various reasons, and uh, nothing bad. Uh, and so, but uh, uh, he stayed there for quite a number of years. He was uh, killed in that plane crash. Where was his office? Is in Whitehurst Hall. Whitehurst Hall. Mm -hmm. okay. Administration building. Your commencement exercises. Well, it. I think I don't know how many there were in that, but there's a whole yard full of them. That we, I remember we, we walking two uh, two abreast, and uh, I seven eight hundred of us graduated at that time. It was a pretty good size. Who gave, who gave the speech for the commencement? I that I don't remember. Mm -hmm. After A and M, what did? Well, like I said, I get my uh, degree in BS in education. And uh, when I got out of school in '31, as the beginning of the two or three years into the Depression, mm -hmm. and uh, there was men running around with doctor's degrees looking for a country school to teach. And uh, of course, every time you make an application, they uh, they say the school board wants to you know, hire people with experience. 
Well, if you're just out of school, you don't have any experience, there's no way of getting experience. So I went back to the farm and went to work on the farm, and one of my other brothers was uh, going to school, or started school at OU then in, in 1931 when I came home. So I got to help uh, run a dairy there and build up a dairy farm and, and work there at, uh, at home until after I was married. Mm -hmm. uh, would you compare going to college before the Depression and then after it hit? How did the change? Well, uh, of course, it didn't take much to go to school there then. Uh, I don't remember what the uh, tuition was per hour, but it was very little compared to today. And uh, I, I made about half my way working in the library at 20 cents an hour, then I got the rest of the little help from home. And, uh, but uh, since I had a job, my, my dad was a federal employee, and the depression didn't hit him as bad as it did other people because he was a government employee. And, uh, and I was working my way through. I just really didn't notice when we went into the depression or, or uh, there wasn't no radical change in our way of living, mm -hmm. you might say, except money got a little tighter all along. Mm -hmm. And when did you get married? I got married in 1934. And what was your wife's name? Anna Beatrice Denton. She lived there in Guthrie. Her father was a uh, brick mason. He came there to build the temple in 1923, and he just decided to call that his home, and, and they just lived there. Otherwise, they used to travel around. Brick masons traveled around a lot, but he came there and worked in the same temple, and he uh, eventually fell off of a building over there at Stillwater Campus uh, as, a, as a stonemason. He, the first day, he wore his bifocal glasses. He misjudged a step down and fell three stories. Mm -hmm. It was lived about three days. Tell me about the temple there. It's a uh, it's a it's a nice place. It's well, I guess it's the largest temple used for Masonic purposes east of the Mis uh, west of the Mississippi River. But uh, there there didn't used to be able to go through it unless you're based in the special things. But now they have it open, and you go through it. Get tours. Go go through that. And I've been through several of the tours, and I've been. Uh, it, it's a magnificent, magnificent building, and you just can't imagine what uh, uh, all the various things they've got in that thing, and those nice rooms and, uh, and, and everything, and cut glass uh, windows and things. It's just magnificent, and anybody that has a chance ought to go through the Masonic Temple of Guthrie. Why is that temple so large? Why do they build it? I uh, really don't know. I don't, uh, I guess they, <laughs> I don't know. But they have a big auditorium there. I don't know whether they were filling it or not, but they do have different uh, uh, things there pertaining to they have the Easter services there and things like that in the auditorium. But it, it's a nice place. I, uh, all five of us boys became Masons, and I, two of us belonged to the sister, but I belonged to the Wichita sister, not the Guthrie yeah. sister. After you got married, what did you do? Well, I. Uh, just did every little job I could for a while. Lived out in the farm with my parents. We stayed there because we didn't have money enough to uh, rent a house. And uh, but uh, well, I stayed on the farm there and worked. And when the WPA came in, I worked on the WPA some and worked for the tag office there. What'd you do with the WPA? Well, we uh, worked on a, a government farm out there. And just uh, in fact, they graveled a whole a field there, a whole around the whole implement building and, and uh, people, the caretaker's driveway just spread chat out there. Then on the, in town, when they built the uh, jail, jail stadium there by the WPA work, I was uh, one of the timekeepers on that job there in building that uh, stadium in Guthrie. How was, how was that program organized, WPA? Well, it just it made work because uh, I think when, uh, when uh, Roosevelt came in and we were on the verge of a revolution or something. There's so many people unemployed and uh, times are so bad and there just wasn't uh, no jobs to be had anywhere. And if he hadn't came along with something like that, the Work Pro Progress Administration, something to put people to work, even at a small salary, why uh, it, it got, the, got the thing going. But really that didn't uh, uh, help the depression much except to just let people live with a, uh, and work for a living instead of being in soup lines. Mm -hmm. But uh, it uh, was, was a wonderful thing to have. Of course, they had the uh, soil conversa conversation uh, services. I know Dad signed up with that and got his farm uh, terraced and a pond built under that. 
And uh, it, uh, of course, we got electricity on the farm then. We never had electricity before. Couldn't have a water system, couldn't have a modern bath until you got electricity to pump the water. And uh, it, just a lot of things happened back there then that uh, improved the conditions. And uh, when the war, of course, when the war came along, uh, the, uh, that, that uh, put an end to the depression there because so many people went to work in the factories and places. And uh, it, uh, it more or less uh, helped things out. What did you do during the war? I was, uh, went in the mail service in 1939, railway mail clerking, and I'd moved to Oklahoma City for about a year, then I moved to Enid for about a year, and left Enid in 1941, no, September the 1st, and, and moved to Wichita, and worked mail in, the, in a terminal up there, Wichita Terminal, and uh, of course I had two children then, and I was about 35 years old, so I didn't get drafted, because I was old and had children in, in a government uh, a position, a trained position as a mail clerk, and they'd, they'd take me, they'd have to retrain someone else for it, so mm -hmm. I uh, worked, uh, just worked mail in the, uh, in the uh, terminal up there in Wichita. What were your duties up there in Wichita? Well, it was just uh, in a big terminal up there, they worked all kinds of mail. We worked uh, Kansas mail, Oklahoma mail, and, and uh, worked with a bunch of circulars, and, and there during the war they'd have this V-mail came in, real thin stuff. Boy, that took a long time to work that because there's a lot of letters in one tie. But uh, a lot of them went, of course, went to air mail. That V-mail was air mail. Uh, letters coming home and going to the uh, uh, Army personnel all over the world. And uh, we, uh, we worked hard. We worked long hours. We worked a lot of overtime. And uh, it uh, did pretty good that in 1945, right after the war, I went out on the road up there. Went on a railroad, a railroad car run from Aldous, Wichita to Aldous, Oklahoma, the Santa Fe branch called the Old Orient Railroad. And I worked on that for 10 years on the Old Orient. Was there a big celebration in Wichita when the war ended? I think so. Did you? Mm -hmm. you I was out. Yeah, I celebrated. What did you do? Uh, went out and invited a little bit too much, and that's the last time I'm going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did you work for the mail service? I worked uh, after uh, I got on the road. They kept cutting off my lines, you know, discontinued these little branch lines. And uh, eventually they cut the, uh, the orient tear off. And uh, I went on the highway post office, that's a working mail on the road in the great big bus. And uh, last seven years from 1960 to, to, last seven years from 60 to 67, I was on the highway post office between Wichita and Belleville, Kansas. And we'd work uh, on, the, just work the mail and, and take a lot of storage mail in, just one person on that run. Besides the, the driver, he drove the, the big long, just like a big city bus, only just all equipped to work mail and, and have a bunch of storage sacks in there too. And that was quite a busy little run. Most of the time in the mail service, you were doing two men's work instead of one. You just like, you just uh, like killing snakes. You're just fighting them all the time, trying to get the mail worked. Yeah. You know, we was, back there then, we, we considered it a privilege to work and get the mail delivered. And uh, of course, after I retired from that, the post service went downhill so much that I was Kind of shame to tell people I used to work in the mail service because it got in such a bad shape there. Uh, how how big was the route that you were on with the with the bus? Uh, well, it was uh, about uh, 185 miles, which to to Belleville. We'd go up there. Used to go up and turn around and come back the same night. That was 15 hours. If you was on your feet for 15 hours, and of course the bus driver he'd get tired. He couldn't cross the state line. Or they're getting, you know. But uh, we went. To, it was all within one state. Went across state line. He'd had to take an eight-hour off. See, but we just stayed within the state, so the, the higher law didn't get him. Of course, the government could work them, their mail clerks to the drop. They didn't care. And it was between Wichita and where? Belleville, Kansas. Okay. That's all about uh, 20 miles from the Nebraska line, okay. straight up, 81. Oh. Okay. And when did you retire from the mail service? I retired when they, when they cut that off. They cut all the mail off the train and buses and, and everything in uh, the fall of 1967. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was just, I'd been in 27 years, but uh, uh, they gave us the privilege of retiring at full pension because they cut our line off, discontinued our job. 
So I had a couple of laundromats up there in Wichita doing pretty good, so I decided I'd just retire, I'd take early retirement, and there was no decrease in pension. Mm -hmm. And of course that was kind of a bad thing to do because five years after I retired, postal salaries nearly doubled. So if I'd have stayed in another eight or seven or eight years, I'd have had a whole lot bigger pension. Yeah. But that's water on the bridge. <laughs> Speaking of water, tell me about the floods in Guthrie and the Cottonwood. Well, <clears throat> I don't, uh, they seem like they, they flooded more since I have left there, but uh, they flooded one or two times when I was there. But they, they finally, uh, used to what they called the elbow down around the, uh, they make a big kind of melt like a curve, and uh, a lot of the uh, uh, colored people lived in there, and uh, I think they finally got uh, flooded out so many times they just left. Mm -hmm. And that's what the rest of them are going to have to do that's left there now. They just seem like that they don't have no, they're poor people, they're, they're uh, j just uh, can't afford to, to blue the home, I guess. And uh, so government buys them out and, uh, or does something to get them out of that flood district because, uh, of course, uh, the main reason it makes it, uh, the cottonwood flood is if the Cimarron is up at flood stage, it holds the, the cottonwood, the big stream is going to take force over, it's going to push the cottonwood back. If the Cimarron hadn't have a whole lot of water in it, then the cottonwood would dump fast enough to take care of the water, but it's a backup that pushes the water out. But uh, it, uh, it, it's a situation there that every time it comes a big rain and then both rivers come up at the same time, you've got a problem there. And uh, I don't know what you're going to do unless the government or somebody comes in and buys those people out. But their businesses too and everything for all of us. Uh, gasoline stations and everything up in that flood district. Hmm. So when did you move to Enid? I uh, was working as a post office uh, railroad mail clerk, the headquarters in, in Oklahoma City. And they had uh, the Frisco up here, had uh, three men up here run from Vernon, uh, Enid to Vernon, Texas on the Frisco. And uh, they, uh, they had almost enough work for four men. But uh, so they, uh, they used to send me up here and run for, and pay me three dollars a day while I went from home per dime. Then they, they got wise and figured, well, if they'd moved me up here, they'd uh, make, this entered my headquarters, then just have to pay me when I went out to Guthrie or still uh, Shawnee and run on different runs, just pay me three dollars a day then. They'd do it cheaper than my bacon eat at my headquarters. So that's when I came to Enid in 1940. And in 41, I left here in, uh, and went to Wichita Terminal as a regular clerk. I was just substituting out of Enid yeah. on the, the Enid Inferno. So when did you move back here this time? This time, I, well, after I uh, retired from the federal post office, we uh, run those two laundromats. Then in 1970 uh, uh, or 69, I went out and went to work at the Wichita State University and at their contract, postal contract station. I ran that for seven years. Mm -hmm. My wife died in 1970, about a year after I went to work there. Then I uh, remarried and, and moved to Florida after I retired from uh, the uh, Wichita State University in 1977. Then I stayed in Florida about a year. Then I moved back to here to Enid. Uh, my daughter lived here, one of my daughters lived here, and another lived in Georgia, uh, pretty close to where I lived in Florida, and another lived in Manhattan, Canada. But now, uh, two of them live down in Atlanta, Georgia, and one lives here in Enid. Well, anything else? Well, I don't know. There's uh, various things I can think of, I guess. I don't remember one time, uh, when I was going to school in Stillwater, our friends, you know, get uh, friends. We'd go to each other's hometown on weekends, you know, take turns about going here and there to Perry or to Guthrie. When my friends lived uh, in McAllister, well, one day, on, and by I think 1928, 29, we were I was we was hitchhiking out to McAllister, go spend the weekend in McAllister, mm -hmm. and uh, we tried to stay together. But of course, uh, hitchhiking is the only way to go. We didn't have no money to go anywhere. Yet. Everybody was hitchhiking then, so uh, we started out to McAllister. Well, we got we got separated, and I was uh, in, I was behind him, and uh, uh, there, uh, on the streets we woke in Oklahoma, right in front of the Baptist Church. There, a man stopped, and I had a little old Ford coupe picked me up, and uh, I got in the car and I glanced at him. And I said to myself, well, I think I see a new picture, so I know you something, but I didn't say anything. And uh, we went on down the road, got about two or three miles out of Holdenville. He pulled up and said, well, he going to go south here and he let me out. 
Well, I d hitchhiked on in McAllister. We were supposed to meet there at the Hollerich Hotel. And uh, as I opened the door to go in the Hollerich Hotel, there was a picture of this man that I just had a ride with on a wanted poster. It was pretty boy Floyd. <laughs> Okay. They, they, uh, Oklahoma, he wasn't wanted in Oklahoma, he was wanted an order from Iowa or Illinois somewhere where he had been uh, robbing people, but the Oklahoma law knew where he lived. That was his, he was going home when he let me out. His parents lived down that road about three miles. He was just coming along there. And what, what kind of guy was he? Seemed to be all right. I, didn't, I don't remember what we talked about, but I did notice on the floorboard there some little bitty square pieces of, of uh, cloth and maybe a little grease or something on it. And after I, put two and two together and found out who it was. I figured he'd been cleaning his gun with these little wads of things laying on the floorboard of this little old Ford coupe he was in. Mm -hmm. They said he picked up, always oh, picked up hitchhiking, took people, he wasn't for us. Uh, he, he just, uh, he wasn't a vicious man. He just wasn't, he just robbed banks back east. <laughs> <laughs> but, Any other uh, stories like that you have? Well, I got one of my, my uh, mother was a, uh, a uh, substitute for my uh, father on his rural mail route. And uh, uh, she was uh, delivered mail on uh, uh, November the 11th, 1911. And uh, it was kind of a warm uh, fall, and she had uh, left with kind of a light dress on, and uh, it was uh, warm, and they'd always stop out to the schoolhouse outside of Guthrie there on the way to, uh, to out the end of the route. And she stopped there and watered the horse, and took her handkerchief and uh, wiped the dust off of her face. Then she went on around the route, and when she got back to that same schoolhouse that afternoon, she had to break ice on the horse trough to get her horse some water, and she was going to wet her handkerchief down to wipe her face again. It was still dusty while it froze. And that was, a, uh, was then a record, and still is a record, the uh, largest drop in temperature in 12 hours, a 68 degrees drop in temperature in 12 hours, and uh, she was out on, in, in that uh, change of weather like that. And another time she was, uh, I guess she just got was all lucky and draw the, another day when the Cimarron River was flooding, and when she got back to the Cimarron River, that was about several miles before she got home, it was flooding, it was up to the floorboard, the boards of the, of the bridge almost, and uh, the old horse, uh, she didn't drive a car, she just drove the horse and buggy. And uh, the old horse, uh, you know, horses, uh, you call it by having horse sense. Well, a horse won't go over a bridge like that unless you need it. There's a man there and said, well, if you want to go across that, I'll, uh, I'll lead the horse. But the horse wouldn't drive because they, they, they know what danger is. But anyway, he, she led that her mother's horse across that bridge with the mail, and they got almost to the other side and heard a noise. Turned around and looked, and the middle span had went out. <laughs> So, uh, mm -hmm. hmm. Well, well, that's almost an hour. The du the dust dust storms now. When they, yeah. uh, 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 when my oldest daughter was born, we lived out in, the, in the, uh, on the farm there. And the uh, house was well. You couldn't hardly build a house solid enough to keep that dust out. It just so that that fine dust would just come in everywhere. Anyway, this. Uh, when my oldest daughter was born, which is Mrs. Nuff, curator here at the museum, uh, we had to put a sheet, wet sheet over her bed in that back room where she, we was living to keep the dust from settling on her and, and, ch and choking her out. But whenever you could see those dust storms are coming, the sky in the northwest would just turn black. In fact, it did, it did almost like an uh, eclipse of the sun. And chickens, it gets so dark, the chickens would go in the hen house. It just uh, that black dust that rolled in there. Had to keep out of the house. Well, you couldn't. It was just fine dust all over. You couldn't even with I don't know the storm wind is always unless it's cock good to go. It it that fine dust just came in through the best of houses. And how'd you eat your food without eating dust? Well, uh, that's a problem. I guess for you have to eat so much dirt in when you like, so I guess that's just part of it. <laughs> well I think we have well, a good my, my uh, oh. uh, uh, uh Middle brother, we call him middle brother. He did a lot of work on the uh, genealogy part. He'd been working for years on that. He lives down in Houston. He's a retired uh, uh, post office inspector. In fact, three of the boys out of the five went in the mail service. 
and we followed her dad in, in the Federal Mail Service. But anyway, he's been working on a, a geology, and uh, he's traced the family history back now. Oh, he's done a lot of work on both uh, three or four different families, but the English family, uh, he, he traced it back till uh, the last he told us that we've related to three presidents, Pocahontas and three English kings. Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Zachariah Taylor as the presidents, and uh, that Pocahontas was uh, related to her, and the three English kings were King Edward II, King Edward III, and uh, one other, John Lackland of England. Hmm. And uh, of course we came, our family came from Virginia, and uh, we're eligible to get in the Sons of the American Revolution, or the DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, because we had a great-grandfather, great, that was a scout in the Revolutionary War. And he, uh, when he way up in the, uh, he was a young man then, just 17 years old, see? And so up in, uh, after the 1800s, he was trying to get a pension. And they asked him uh, what unit, battalion and so forth he's left. He told him, he said, well, he, he didn't work but uh, three or four, three or four months out of the winter. He wasn't working. He said, well, we didn't fight. He didn't need no, any scouts there then. They just hold up. And so he got his uh, uh, pension through, so therefore all of us are eligible for the sons and daughters of the American Revolution. And uh, his name was uh, Solomon Royce. And he uh, lived quite old, and he married a younger woman. And, and I think they're paying, uh, I forget, way up into the 1850s, they are paying her a pension from the Revolutionary War because she had married this old great grandfather of ours when she was young and of course he died and she kept living without being married and way up to 1850, nearly 100 years after the Civil War, they had paid a pension to yeah, The Revolutionary War? The Revolutionary War. Well, where, did she, where did they live? What's that? They live in Virginia? Yeah, they lived, well, yes, he, uh, they was in Virginia at the time. And did his widow live in Virginia also? Yes. Yeah. He had several widows, I think. Well, you know, they, they they get married those days and raise a family here, and then they, they just leave and uh, go to another county, and raise another family, take another wife, raise another family, and, and not the benefit of the divorce, and they just keep on going. Well, what else? I don't uh, remember much anything else. Well. I'd like to come back, you know, later on, we can do it again. Yeah. You can think of some more stuff. Oh, I can think of a lot of stuff. I don't know whether you want it or not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you learn a lot of little jokes. Sure. Okay. Well, there's a <coughs> farmer lived right south of us there in Guthrie. His name was Herzl, Louis, and uh, uh, Bill Herzl. And uh, they'd like to go out on Sundays. They had several farms, and they'd go out on Sunday to you know, drive around the country. They had those do cars in the, back in 1911, 12. They had to do it. And uh, he was out driving and, and uh, on Sunday and the uh, old country road kind of went to the top and, and couldn't hardly pass on, the, you know, very well. Then it rained. It had a little shower of rain. And uh, they were sitting up there in a big old touring car and, and uh, his wife says, uh, Oh boy, see the pigs. She saw a sow out in the field, a bunch of little pigs. She says, Oh boy, see the pigs. Well, he turned to see the pigs and turned to wheel too and he ended up in the bar ditch. Well, it was Sunday and he was a Lutheran and he could leave and swear on Sunday. He didn't say a word, he just went out and had to go get down the road and the farmhouse, get a team of mules and come pull him back up and got him on the road. And uh, as he got started down the road, he turned to his wife and said, Bell, next time you see pigs, see pigs. Don't say Louis, see pigs. <laughs> Another time, the same couple went out to visit neighbors right south of them on Sunday nights. That's what they do on Sunday nights, they go visiting. And uh, they visit about dark. And, and uh, it was before they had self-starters on cars, the old Buick had to twist his tail to get it started. He went out there and tried to start to crank that car and with a start, and he pulled a gooser out, you know, choked, and a little ring on the front there. And cranked and cranked, and he stopped, get his breath again, he's an old man then. And, uh, his wife sitting up there in the seat, all waiting for him to, ready to go home. And pretty soon he cranked some more and he stopped to rest. She turned her head out and says, Why, Louie, there must be something wrong with it. He says, Oh, hell yes, I know there's something wrong with it. <laughs> Good start. But as soon as they first uh, uh, 
car, a battery car, powered car coming out. He got in a battery powered yeah. car so he <laughs> wouldn't have to crank it. Right. <laughs> well, I think we have a good interview. Well, thank you. Okay, sir. Yeah. Okay.